Dr. Richard Hodge, welcome back to the Plant Yourself podcast. Hey, thank you so much, Howie. It's, uh, it's good to continue and uh, see if we can round out this conversation today. Yeah, I was just thinking, I, I posted another episode, and one of the things I do is I go through the video and I look for a screenshot where like both of us are smiling and our eyes are open, and you just came in strong with like <laughs> with happy vibes. So this, this should be easy. Now I'm just trying to remember to keep my eyes open so we get a good shot. <laughs> So welcome back back. We've had two conversations uh, yes. leading up to the, the more complex one. And um, today I think we're, you want to talk about sort of the four quadrant model, which I am using all the time. Um, it's, it's almost like it's the hot knife that, you know, it's, it's microwaving, <laughs> heating up the knife so that it cuts through the butter of my problems because without it, I can tend to approach them from anywhere and I kind of make progress eventually, but it's slow and haphazard, whereas starting with these four quadrants really gives me clarity. So as much as I hate to share it with other people because it's such a competitive advantage, <laughs> uh, I, I am an attention whore and, I, and, and, and it's, it's a beautiful thing that you're sharing with the world. So uh, I'd love to get into it when you're ready. Yeah, well, look, I've uh, I've been um, in uh, you know, the systems engineering community for uh, thirty years um, or so, and uh, and they're you know well known for you know getting big things done and and working artfully together to make things happen, bringing multiple companies and whatever else together through those processes, but distilled down it comes down to you know four groups of questions um, those that are drive meaning that are around the why those that are drive connection that are around the how how do we keep the things that need to stay together together then actually the what type questions of what we're going to do and then how do you then if we do that will it have the Im impact so it's all those if type questions that invite test and evaluation um, so, uh, I, to me, that, that really helps simplify what can be some of the um, most challenging problems that, uh, that we face. Mm. Yeah. So when you, when you uh, say what drives what, like the how drives connection, to me, that's not at all obvious upon hearing it. So I'm sort of, you know, not, nodding politely, but I'm like, <laughs> what, you know, what's he talking about? Um, so maybe can you talk a little bit before we get into it, like how you arrived at this model? Because one of the one of the things you do is you wade through a ton of complexity to come up with something simple on the other side. And I would love to kind of get a sense of how you do it. Well, it did start with a systems engineering model, and I was um, uh, invited to uh, provide some support to a general within the Australian Department of Defence who had four new divisions, one looking at why we need defence at all, one looking at uh, what it is, you know, how, how defence operates in, in the, this world of Australia, and three, what it is defence really needs to do, and then four, if we did that, you know, could we achieve it successfully? and and. I used that model, and instead of just taking those, you know, main elements of systems engineering, I just simply put the labels against it. Of instead of needs, requirements, and um, uh, and form, um, and test and evaluation, I simply used why, what, how, and if, and and that just made conversations with executives so much easier. You know, so why do we need a defence force? And you can ask, all right, this was my context as to how I started, um, but delete defence if that's not your bag and put in a health organisation or uh, Red Cross or community service organisation or your local school or whatever. Or vacation, right? Or, a, well, or indeed a vacation. However, vacation is an answer, right? <laughs> Well, maybe. I mean, for me, you know, it's like, oh, wait, we're all going away. Why? Yeah. <laughs> like, like okay. you know, t 
to, to just no, to yeah, ask yeah, the yeah, question. Yeah, you're exactly right. But why then what does that do? And then how does that do it? And if and th that's a, a, a thinking process. Then you go to the test and evaluation. If we did that, implemented that solution, would it give us what we expected at the outset? The, you know, it's the thing that drives meaning. And, and, and so the why attaches to meaning. The, um, the, the, the what attaches more to um, the, the actual, well, product or service that you're actually going to uh, deliver and and the, the how to the to the experience and then you're just testing as to whether or not um, what you've chosen as the product is actually going to deliver the meaningful experience that you expect and and you can think of that in capability terms I was trying to relate you sort of uh, uh, derailed my thinking a little by tossing in a vacation <laughs> instead oh. of something complex like a defense organization but um, <laughs> you know it, it, you, it's you've never whole... you've never traveled with me if you think a vacation is not as complex <laughs> as a military operation <laughs> <laughs> well um, right. yeah it's but fair I, I also yeah and I also want to give people practice in applying this in small ways to see, you know, personally to see its utility, because that's largely how I've been applying it right. uh, as, as I develop skill. Yes. Right. Right. Because I, I, I would, I would it, it's not a habit of mine to say, why am I doing this? Right. And but then that uh, really ties into, you know, it's one of the best questions that we learn to ask as a three year old right incessantly and and yet by the time we've been through our primary school years almost we've we've forgotten or it's been i think sir ken robinson um that who's since passed um you know his ted talk is one of the top ted talks on uh, uh, uh in the world on how schools will kill creativity and, uh, and and that's what happens, you know, and it actually kills that questioning of why. And uh, and I think that that's critical to actually, you know, a a achieving the a meaningful change to deliver the sort of meaningful life that we want. Mm -hmm. And and that we're always in, you know, like Viktor Frankl's in search of meaning. You know, it's it's meaning that that we're. Um, as humans uh, in, in search of frequently. So that's why a why question is, is pretty vital. So that's really where we would start. So um, now, what, what sort of... <laughs> my, my temptation... <clears throat> is to jump into some of the big topics because you know my uh, uh, the handle on my website is no problem too big uh, yeah. for us to act and leave the world better for what we've done your uh, uh, desire is to try and say well look yes okay we can deal with big problems like degrowth growth and degrowth or uh, uh, climate change or you know elimination of poverty and the like or we can can we apply that same process of thinking to something that's um, you know more personal and and something to which yeah. we as individuals can then attach uh, our, ourselves to and um, and I think that uh, well I know that we can and I yeah. know that the same fundamentals exist that we are looking for. Um, answers to why in fact we're in search of meaning and and if we're in search of meaning then why questions are the best ones to get us there mm -hmm. if we're in search of connection then how questions are really the the the, the ones to focus on because it it explores the relationships right not just the parts but then when we 
want a, a piecewise perspective, then we can get into the what questions because then we can get into, well, making it very tangible that I'm talking about doing this in this situation, right? And then if type questions go, well, if we take that thought and make it real, will it deliver and contribute to deliver the meaning that we're seeking? And, and that's just the nature of the, the, the quadrant. And, and we can go through that in a, you know, constant infinity loop from why, how, what, if. And that's Great. the nature so, of life. Yeah. So my inclination is to, to let you run with the examples that you're very familiar with and the, <laughs> the, the models that you've, you know, have developed within. And then I'll probably <laughs> think of a problem in my life that I want your help with. So we can, we can kind of do it at scale. All right. Well, let's, let's, let's have a look now. Um, I know this is a podcast, so I'll try, you know, doing my best to talk this through. But what um, uh, I like to do um, is that is to provide some visual cues for the people that I'm talking with as I typically, you know, engage in this um, uh, in either, a, you know, a mentoring or a, an, an advisory uh, or an exploratory capacity. Um, because it's those visual cues that help us relate the why to the how to the what to the if and and see the infinity and the connection between those four ways of thinking. So, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I, and I'll, and I'll, I'll I will you know, people listening to this, I will have added to the introduction that I recommend that this is a visual, that this is a YouTube rather than a jog around the block podcast. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and people um, will do, do with that what they will. <laughs> Splendid. All right. Well, we'll we'll do our best for those potties who just like to to, to listen, uh, to talk through it uh, uh, co coherently as we go. Um, so I'm. Oh no, I need to um, switch over to there, and I've got a uh, the, the 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 four quadrants, which simply in in the in the top right. Uh, so all I've drawn um, is a cross on a, a piece of paper, and uh, I, I typically like to do this on a an A3, or if you're a, a, you know in the imperial sizes, a folio size piece of paper, um, um, or a A4 and quarto will not give you as much space, but that's okay. You don't need a, a huge amount of space uh, to do these because, uh, and I've drawn a quadrant, just a pair of crosshairs to divide the um, uh, folio into four sections. And the top right, we're talking about the why. The bottom left, how. Top left, what. And the bottom right is the if. And we're going to cycle through these from the why to the how to the what to the if, so that we end up with that sort of infinity loop that enables us, as we've learnt, to revisit the why, revisit the how, change the what, and indeed change the actions that we might put into the uh, if column. And, and it's that then that enables us ultimately to build a learning cycle that connects meaning to action. And, and that's essentially what we're about. So I'm going to zoom in onto the uh, Y quadrant. And I'm going to draw a simple ladder of, um, a, 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 that, that, that will ask uh, you just to fill in with five words. And typically it's almost like a, a, a sentence uh, completion test and if we're talking about um, a a business that feels that you know it's a uh, could do with some change and, um, and and some shift then I will ask 
them to say, you know, my business is mm, and give me a word that is it describes the state of the business. And I feel. Mm, how do you feel about that state? And I'm quite deliberate in seeking something that's an objective statement of the state of the the, the business or uh, and 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 an emotional measure, you know, that's quite subjective, but it, it goes to, you know, driving the meaning as to why you want to change, that you're not prepared to put up with the status quo anymore. Um, and <clears throat> in, in one organization, you know, they um, were really, uh, and we were dealing with a new governance uh, framework. And they, uh, uh, you know, really felt that they had taken um, a very much a, an ad hoc uh, a, a approach to their regulation, and and they felt more as though they were acting in a, cons you know, a, a constabulary. You know, that they, they felt um, as as enforcers, and they felt uh, uh, really as though it was. A, a case of you know exercising power over people and it was not the sort of relationship that they actually wanted in the regulatory world then i said well let's looking ahead you know once we go through this change program and ask well if this change whatever that might be is successful how would you like the state of the organization to be and um, their, their, their sense was that actually that it would work really quite systemically that we would understand the relationships amongst everything and and that we would not you know all of this ad hocery would have disappeared and indeed they would feel as collaborators not as constables oh and I can't spell um, I'm not going to let that stand. For <laughs> raters, <laughs> and um, and then the issue was, well, in order to go from ad hocery to a systemic uh, state, so that you feel less of a constable and more of a collaborator, um, what was the breakthrough issue? And that actually came down to something that in an organizational state, really that they would have at least get to the point where everyone was compliant with one approach to regulation and, and governance instead of having all of this ad hocery. Well, can we agree on one way forward? And then once we get to a state of compliance, then we can work on how we get beyond compliance. So that then enabled us to uh, look at, well, what was the program that was going to achieve that first piece of compliance? But more importantly, then having achieved that, how do we then shift the organization beyond compliance so that the regulator was more a collaborator? Mm. And, so and can, can, I, can I jump in there for a yeah, second? Yeah, please. Yeah, so I am picturing that you go in, you sit them down and you say, so what's the state now? And they say, oh, we're ad hoc. And you say, how does that make you feel? And you say, we feel like constables. But I'm sure it didn't happen like that. So I'd love to kind of sort of like unscrew your brain. And like if I ask people how they feel about a state, the th you know, as let's say as a, as a consultant and I'm working with a, with a business and there's, you know, these veneers of professionalism, they'll either like not understand the word feeling um, and just come up, you know, or and that is true. Right. Like, so when you say, like, I feel constabulary, that's not the same as saying I feel shame or I feel uh, fear. No, 
<clears throat> so it was a mix because it was a large organization there was a mix of feelings but by and large people didn't like um uh they, they, they didn't feel um the value in their job of actually helping the organization forward um through being you know that they they, they they felt disin more di inclined to disengage because they disliked the constabulary nature of the work so they f they they were feeling disengaged they were feeling frustrated that they wanted to be you know, far more collaborative and helping the organization uh, get beyond compliance um and and so that that notion of um constables came about as um through a group conversation that was you know like a metaphor for them to go yeah that's that's exactly what's causing us to feel disengaged frustrated and um you know uh, uh, um, and and not attuned to advancing the organization whereas um uh, we would feel far more empowered, almost like a partner in progress, if we could um, be seen and act in a more collaborative frame. Mm -hmm. So I can see how you're getting them to create meaning in this quadrant, right? Because like right. Fr frustrated and disengaged doesn't necessarily have meaning attached to it that can generate progress, right? But when you, no, when, they, when, right. you when they say, oh, from constabulary to collaboration, then that, yeah, that kind of... Constable to a collaborator, then, then they, that was a simple turn of phrase for them to go, yeah, that, that, and that shift embodies the sort of feeling I want to, you know, so now what do I... That, that brought to the emotional uh, engagement, right? Mm. That, that really um, uh, empowered them to becoming, uh, well, to actually begin to own the change program that they were about to design because they hadn't even designed it at this point, right? Hmm. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, then, uh, what, <laughs> where we, we, we next go in this? Uh, little thing is is down to well how does that happen and I'm going to draw some circles over the um, and actually I'll draw them down here first and I like Venn diagrams um, of three circles um, for a, 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 a good reason um, and that is that within each circle you can put one idea and that if you're trying to uh, have a conversation about then how do you move from ad hoc to systemic how do you get people to um, feel less of the constable and more of the collaborator uh, then you 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 can't shift you know any more than than three new ideas sort of breaks the human brain at once and it needs those in place before you can then um change so i i bring the three circles up and overlay them on on there to say well i need to look at how um something might change in the way we're thinking about this something might change in the way in which we um, uh, uh, act and something might change in the way in which we control and those are the um, main uh, things that uh, uh, that that we want now another way of saying that and you've noticed i've just turned the model around um, is to say that we needed to actually how do we actually make the shift is changing something in the way in which well, it helps if i have a pencil 
in the way in which we think about it and strategize ways in which we do the operations or the execution and the ways in which we apply the the governance and um and and that provides the the, the control and it's that governance then that drives you know, towards and beyond compliance, but it's more about shifting the focus onto um, their behaviour rather than um, on on the actual regulation uh, itself. So, the way in which we thought about the strategy, uh, well, in fact, it was it was more from a governance perspective to begin with, because we had to break through this issue and moving people from a thousand and one black letter regulations, which caused the was driving the constabulary nature. Hey, you're breaking these rules. Hey, you're breaking these rules to going. Well, look, what is the one singular objective that binds us? And then how do we put control measures in place? How do we put control measures in place that enables everyone to focus on that outcome? Now, this was in a, um, a, a, a naval uh, example. So one thing that we could agree that for every aspect of maritime operations, we um, could agree, everyone could agree on one objective, and that was to maximize the operational capability of the mission system for the task that it's being given while eliminating or minimizing harm to people, the public and the environment. And you go, wow. Now everyone could sign up to that because they then were looking at their own mission systems that they controlled. They were all given their own tasks that set the context in which they were going to use it and then asked, how are you going to maximize the operational effectiveness for your mission system, given the tasks that it's got to do and that it's been directed by government, while minimizing the harm to people, public and the environment, okay. or eliminating the harm. Um, and, and that was superb, and that became the cornerstone for the um, regulatory strategy. So it then shifted from here's all of the regulations that you must follow, to here is um, a policy framework that is, um, has an outcome focus and is goal-based, so it had a number of goals, and then they were asked how they were going to meet the goals, and then the governance framework wasn't a case of hitting them over the head, but actually going to them and saying, you know, you tell me whether or not you did what you said you would do. And if not, why not? So it just completely shifts. The strategy was to completely shift the nature of the conversation. And you could see then its direct impact. We didn't have to work out the operations of the mission systems, that was for them to do. So it took that, the regulator, right out of their world, except in a collaborative sense of having that conversation of making sure they were still consistent in delivering the enterprise outcome. Okay, so... Does that make sense? It's, uh, I'll tell you what makes sense, and then you can fill <laughs> me in on where... So as, as I, so my, I mean, my main question is, are these three... Um, words in the Venn diagram, so stra strategize, governance, slash control and operations, are they universal or is that what you came up for this particular situation the, or would it be for any, any organization? That it can be universal because it, it, we wanted it to filter down um, in ways in which how can that be interpreted at the highest level of the organization where we're concerned with the health of it 
How can that be uh, uh, interpreted at the middle level of the organization that was largely setting policy frameworks? And how could that be interpreted at the sharp end where they were actually exercising the mission systems? And then further, how could each and every one of us go, but how am I in my work living to that outcome and um, controlling my behavior in accordance with the goals of the organization. And, uh, uh, and that really then shifted uh, it so that everyone was able to interpret and change the way they were thinking and strategizing, the way they were working and, and operating, and the way in which they exercised self-control, as well as how they exercised operational and, and tactical control over their work to raise issues up. Because that is really the, the, the main thing, is for things that are going wrong to being able to, to be heard where they need to be heard. Mm. and not squashed down. So, so here's where I'm coming from. When I hear you describe this story, and I typically have not come in with, with large systems frames. So I think you know, when you hear about you know, the lower level of this, it's like people are pissed off with, yeah. at, at, with each other. And so you know, there's you know, sort of individual psychological interventions we could do. We could do wellness. We could do movie nights. We could do uh, appreciation and gifts and things like that. Right? So I would come in at the, at the next level higher and say, OK, what I'm seeing in this organization are issues of alignment, respect, and trust. And that's kind of how I would go in. But I, I can feel how that's already a little bit squishy, like it's sort of like the gears are old and they're not they're slipping. Whereas your model of strategy, operation and governance feels like it gets to the levels that I'm talking about, alignment, respect and trust and the the levels of experience disengaged, unhappy, but in yeah. a in a much more comprehensive and reliable way. Is, so does that does that sound like I understand what you're talking about? Uh, yes, I, th I think what you you're touching on with, you know, alignment, respect and trust comes into part of the the governance uh, framework that uh, that was uh, instituted, where in, indeed it, it, you know, recognized that everyone has the capacity despite any rank on shoulder or whatever else, because it was a defense organization, that if you see something, say something. And, and that, that actually then just um, lets the air out of the, the otherwise um, power uh, uh, in, inequalities. Um, and, and that they were as expected to have alignment with the overall outcome. They were expected to have respect for juniors saying, hey, sir, this isn't working or hey, sir, what you're asking of me will create a problem because and um, and and then the trust that emerges from those conversations um, is something that then enables um, the collaboration to actually be seen and lived and not just be something that's a, a, a often talked about, but then rarely actually happens. Hmm. Uh, and, and, and in other organizations, in other situations, the, my, those three words might be different, right? They might. Yes. Uh, right. But but you get at them. By looking, so so I'm I'm starting to appreciate. But I think actually in many organisations, those that you know, those are almost u universals, right? That they're why are you in this organisation if you're not aligned with what it's doing? You know, if you why are you in this organisation if you're not if if the meaning you're deriving isn't deri isn't aligned with the meaning that the organisation holds? You know, maybe there's a message there for you to find another job that aligns with the, the meaning that you, you, you're seeking in the world. Um, uh, but equally, 
and even more strongly if when people are aligned with um, meaningful work, then their loyalty um, increases, their capacity to uh, speak up and and contribute um, just amplifies extraordinarily. Yeah, and I think what what I'm starting to understand is that the at the at the level that you're talking about, you have a lot more tools at your disposal. So if I want to go in and someone says, hey, I need to increase trust in the organization, and that's the level at which I'm in analyzing and solving, that's kind of a you know big squishy water balloon. <laughs> like yeah. why whereas uh, you, you, in fact it's an emergent property. So you know which yeah. It's a very entangled issue and so entangled that you you will never really be able to explore cause and effect. Yeah, yeah, because also, you know, if I if I come down to sort of the three things we want in life, you know, so if we have alignment, respect and trust, I might say, well, then the people in this organization will experience, you know, love, peace, joy. Right. Which also right. we might say are universals. But they're like hyper emergent or emergent squared. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and, right. and, and why, you know, generally, I think that um, uh, it's it's difficult to put them up as being the uh, they're along the lines of, you know, truth, beauty and goodness. But I, I think that they're you know inherent in most of us. Yeah. Not yeah. all of us in right. some way. But as you say, tr trying, trying to change emergent properties by focusing on them themselves is I can't remember where I heard this metaphor recently, but it's like trying to change the workings of the factory by dealing with the smoke coming out of the smokestack. Well, that's not a bad metaphor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, <laughs> no, that uh, that that works. Um, <laughs> OK, yeah. so so we've got our, our, our Venn diagram of the three, uh, the three words, stra strategy, mm -hmm. operation and, and governance. And, uh, what I like about strategy, operations and governance is that, you know, it's about how what are you going to change from whatever situation you're in? The, you, the thinking that got you there won't get you beyond that. So what are you going to change about your thinking? What you've been doing all along? Um, the status quo is no longer adequate to take you forward. So what are you going to do that's different? And then how are you going to control? So, you know, the behavior and the thinking, because it needs to keep both need to keep moving forward. And and that's the control issue. It's not control over, but therefore shifts to control with because you want to create a learning relationship amongst them and and that's why I talk about these things must be forever connected so how is about connection and because you never want strategy and and execution to be apart you know and too often we see an extraordinary gap between the two and governance tries to fill it yeah. and and <laughs> it fails so what I'm picturing in my head when you say control, which is a word that I naturally chafe against, uh, <laughs> right? Just just semantically, but I'm I'm thinking something something more cybernetic, right? If like the feedback, the naturalistic yeah, feedback. Sure, that's part, part and parcel of it. Um, I I perhaps it's just the systems uh, thinker, systems engineer in me, but um, you know if if. If we weren't able to control energy in our bodies, then we just wouldn't exist as living organisms. So control is the essence of life. So it's how it's exercised is what we should be most concerned with. And, and if it's done well, like within our bodies, then largely we don't need to think about it. It's happening autonomically. So... If you think about the control that's happening within your heart, you know, like your heart, you know, you're going into, um, uh, you know, go for a bit of a run, the heart beats faster, pump, blood pumps faster, uh, etc. Endorphins and whatever else are released and so on and so forth. But all of that is is happening within the body and you're not consciously controlling it. So what is the analog 
for organisations that enable us to achieve that same level of autonomous control. And then that will leave people um, able to do meaningful work and to contribute to the future direction of the enterprise. Mm. So that's, that's really why I get quite um, attached to the notion of control um, when you look at it as being the essence of life and organisations being living things. But I understand why it would chafe you, right? Mm. Yeah. In fact, I was sitting in a systems thinking round table um, uh, two years ago uh, at uh, uh, an international conference and one of the systems engineers around the table had exactly your reaction and said, well, actually, I think we should go further and actually not use the word in our community. <laughs> mm. But, you know, it, thank God um, we do have an essence of control um, because it's part and parcel of flying, driving, living. We need control surfaces. <laughs> And we need to think about them as we work within the organisation as much as we don't think about them within our own, uh, li you know, um, very existence as a human. OK, I'll buy All that. Right. For, I'll buy that for now. I'll dream on it. <laughs> yeah, come back to me, Howie. Um, right. So then you go, well, look, that's all right. Big picture stuff, big hands, small map. How do we actually get down to something that's um, a, a, a little more um, work. And then you look at the what. So there I'm taking up things around the operations, strategy, and governance. Now I've got to try and hope that I remember, and I'm drawing nine boxes above them. Okay. Do you want to put your um, tablet on oh, the screen? Oh, yeah. Oh, what a good idea. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And for each of these, I'm, I'm saying, so what are... You know, when we think about um, uh, 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 operations, then what are the sorts of things that, that we might uh, be uh, concerned uh, with? And, you know, one might be um, indeed, uh, <coughs> you could think of it as, I don't want to use uh, blue. Um, you know, production control, um, or, which is really about um, all of the information and communications that is required. So if people don't like production control, they could think of it as, uh, you know, the information and, and communications needed to actually synchronize across different work units, right? Because we're all working towards that same goal. And then you could think about um, the actual management uh, function um, or the overall operations control uh, in, in a sense. But this is that part of uh, an enterprise where a manager, you know, at, uh, is the point, a, a point of integration across the different work units. And it's almost like the first point of integration across different work uh, units. And, and then think about um, the you know, a, a, a assessment functions, because you can't do the management unless you've got some form of uh, you know, assessment uh, uh, channels coming back into you. So you know, the sort of measures that you're putting in place and, and the like become absolutely crucial to that. Um, <clears throat> then 
and and so what I'm trying to build out here and and without getting is just the next level of detail down and and no more than than three main and they're almost like folders of of activities that uh, uh, of concern that uh, we would want to um, explore and then from the strategy uh, uh, perspective well there there would be um, the um, the actual planning function and 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 how that uh, 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 occurs um, and uh, equally the um, some some concern about the future state because too often there's not enough thinking done outside of the current constraints so it's it's how one actually thinks beyond the system that you're actually uh, uh, in <coughs> and I'm and I am now um, oh yes then there is uh, I think here is the overall system design so that you're actually maintaining you're maintaining a perspective of the changing state of the organization right uh, as if it were a system in its own right and often that's a reasonable uh, uh, expectation but too often they you know we see enterprises and um, even small businesses well it's easier with small businesses um, to have and maintain a view of how the whole hangs together and how it all works but as organizations and enterprises get bigger then they've lost all sight of how it actually works and if people are asked how it works what's the first thing they bring up their organization chart and that's not how it works that's not the system design and and people then become you know whatever little box they fit in within that organization chart and they because they've lost the relationships uh, amongst the parts that's so, that's really interesting because I, I was talking to um, to a friend who's a um, a systems thinker and also very interested in, in um, cancer and his definition of cancer is just what you said it's it's a an entity that's forgotten its relationship to the parts. Right. Yes. Uh, 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 absolutely right. Yes, indeed. Um, and uh, and and that often and <clears throat> a lot of times I don't know quite uh, what health services are like there, but um, as health services get. Um, squeezed and and even more squeezed uh, across the world, and I, I know it's a sort of a global problem. The amount of time that you can buy with your general practitioner, who typically is the the person who has the the whole of you view, um, you you risk uh, them treating one ailment, forgetting about. You know the contraindication in, 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 in indications um, for other elements, and you know my mother uh, suffered that before she she died in terms of you know treatments from the cardiologist, treatments from the um, kidney specialist, and and they were working against each other, and it was only when her general practitioner said, "Oi, you two specialists, we need a conference around here because you're fighting against each other and, and my patient's body is suffering in the middle. Mm. <laughs> so, you know, and, but who is that general practitioner in, in an organization? Mm. And that's, that's what you mean by the systems? The system design, design. you know. Uh, so if you think, you know, a, a general practitioner... Um, is seen as sometimes almost like a an entry level and and i'm pleased in australia that they've now said that general practice is a specialization in its own right mm. because it's crucial and they are the, they describe themselves here as specialists in life and that they have to understand like every other specialist 
how the human body works, how it's connected, before they're allowed to conduct one intervention on a human. However, in the world of business, there's no general practitioner, there's no general medical training or general organisational training on how an organisation works. They don't know too often. And, and you wouldn't let a doctor near you that hadn't bloody passed their anatomy and physiology. So in, in other words, that, that any group of people getting together for some common purpose will have emergent properties and they can vary wildly based on yeah. who's the, you know, a personality or the butterfly effect of how something was decided very haphazardly at the beginning. Um, and, and so when you're talking about control, about sort of no, noticing and being intentional yeah. uh, so that you get the emergent properties you want rather than what we see in most organizations is people who are you know, disengaged, giant corporations untouched by the damage they're doing around yeah. the world. And, well, we and, need and, to, and only and accountable only to people who care about quarterly earnings. Right on, um, and so that is just the short termism that that happens, and and within within this model, um, that's really where um, this space over here in the management. If that is just driving, um, I'm not sure if you could see that, but yeah, I've, yeah. I've colored in there the, 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 the management piece. Um, if that's just driven by short term earnings, then none of this really matters. None of this really matters. Um, and 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 that is really part of uh, part of the problem and why you end up with a gap between strategy and execution um, uh, is that everything then is seen as short term. Um, and that is part of the, you know, that management concern is a very, you know, um, reasonable and valid concern. You, you know, business is in it for profit, but if it's being uh, constrained or, you know, restrained to maximizing profit, then really it, it doesn't matter too much. All of these future states and system design uh, issues fall by the way um, because the um, pressures of short-term performance outweigh the investment required to reap longer-term benefits. Yeah, well, it reminds me, you know, I, I was a, uh, a distance runner and I'd, I'd, I'd run a marathon and my body would make very different decisions as I was depleting it in the marathon, you know, right. all, of a, all of a sudden, things like blood glucose became emergencies and right. hydration became an emergency and tissue repair became an emergency. And so I'd always get sick afterwards because all these functions had been, you know, repair and long term yes. maintenance, immune function. All, all of these were shot to hell because the because, you know, Q4, you know, the body was in short term survival mode. Um, and there it's, we are. it's and, understandable. And it was just simply managing within the constraints that you were giving it. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, running a marathon is a, it, it, it's, it's ironic, but it's an extremely short term activity. <laughs> Mate, I, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> I think I think the longest I've run is five mile, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and and I was half the age that I was that I am now. <laughs> it's a very civilized distance. <laughs> I, I, I recommend it. Yeah, and I I also you know was brought up believing that walking is God's exercise. So <laughs> whether or not that's true, it's, it works for for my wife and I. Yeah, a friend of mine, Michael Gelb, just wrote a book called Walking Well. About the, walking Well. Walking yeah. Well, about the physical and spiritual, psychological, cognitive benefits of walking. It just came out, so I'm uh, looking forward to including that. So I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, all right. Um, in the uh, 
governance just to finish off these last three and um, <clears throat> I'll come back to the uh, chart then one of the crucial things around governance before you can control everything and if you remember what we did in in the story within uh, the defense environment was actually set a strategic outcome for the governance uh, function um, but it actually is about policy and identity and I, I probably should put those words around the other way that identity comes first and then the policy frameworks that sit under that um, to to um, regulate behaviors towards living the identity and um, and so that people you know gain meaning from that and and if that sense doesn't capture uh, the meaning then um, you know pretty much uh, all, all else um, uh, fails so when you when you say identity do you mean the identity of the organization like this is what we stand for or the identity of the individual members or both or well, uh, it, this is at an organizational level the organizational uh, uh, identity and um, from that uh, you know identity then they were able to draw you know, when it came down to looking at the operations, that first box we filled in, then they were able to draw um, another three circle then that really means that for everything that goes in the water, it's got to be able to float, move and fight. <laughs> right. Um, and, and that then helped <laughs> provide a simple framework around um, you know, it's it's not enough, like for most boats, to be able to float and move, but you've actually got to be able to put it in harm's way and do dangerous things with it and keep people alive while you do that. And um, and, and that just changed then the, you know, the operational environment and made, made that. Mm. So that, that then was how the identity flew down, uh, flowed down um, through into the, you know, the next level of thinking. I imagine that conversation generally involves trade-offs, right? Like I would, I would think move and yeah, fight definitely. might, you, you know, it's like a, a like a, a, a like a fan. Like where I, I was just shopping for like a, a fan that blows air, and the the ones I wanted were big and loud, so that's not going to work in my office. But like, like now you have people having to have conversations about move. And fight, right? They seem like you know the faster it moves, maybe the lighter it is, the less armoring or the fewer weapons systems it has. That's right. And and even how many people you put on board, because that means then um, that you need room for berths and uh, you know accommodations and messing and um, uh, versus ammunition. And so there's a trade-off between you know. So then, which systems do you automate? and which systems need the person in the loop. And, and that is the, the, the constant trade-off. But we're all making these trade-offs through life, right? And, and therefore, the identity is uh, crucial because, and, and in, in the military, they have something called the, com the commander's intent. And, and that is a, a statement of outcome and of the goals that they're seeking to achieve by a particular time. Um, but it enables all of the decision makers underneath the commander to when they come up with making these compromises to say, but if I'm not sure, then which of those compromises takes me closest to the commander's intent? Mm. And, and, and that is derived from the overall identity frame. So uh, and, uh, you know, I, I've written um, last month a, a piece as a LinkedIn article called the Leadership Covenant and it tries to take that very idea out into uh, the world um, for people to state very clearly how they conceive value, how they contribute value and how they count value and, uh, and, and speak to that because then people understand really their identity and 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 are then able to um, see 
and, and, and invoke meaning for why they see people doing certain things. You go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, he, he's uh, or, or seeking to be as sustainable as possible on the plot of land that um, he and his wife are living on. Hmm. Got it. All right. I think I'm I think I'm good with the with the what. So OK. The... And um, then there is. You know, at the, the, the strategic uh, communications, because it's it, whereas the communications over here was helping with okay. the management. Oh, would you go, go back to the tablet? Uh, I beg your pardon. The, yeah, yeah. Is it, you know, there's communication and. This is more about internal communications and information exchange that enables management and operational control. This is about communication for awareness and understanding externally. Um, but uh, uh, and I'm, <laughs> yeah, I, I'll have to admit, um, uh, Howie, I, I have I knew I'd forget one, um, but I, I, I think that and I forget the label, but I'm going to put um, up here and 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 it uh, from a greek word an algidonic uh system and what that really is driving towards is that need for um an immediate response uh, -uh there's danger boom and and so that that is able to go straight up to the, you know the headquarters or a sign from the brain you know and so an algidonic system within our uh, ourselves is that if we brush past something and it's really hot then we tend to jump away so that signal's gone very rapidly to the brain and we have reacted well what is that sort of um, bushfire alarm in an organization that goes but if that little thing breaks we need to know about it up here straight away because it's so critical and the domino effect could be that we need to, to have a response uh, um, uh, put through um, the organization rapidly. We can't wait for the dominoes to fall. So it's, it's that sort of strategic and, and instantaneous re, um, alert and response mechanism now, now is that a matter of of judgment of getting the right people in the right roles like what came to me was like you know some cold war scenario where a bird flies across the screen and someone is in the silo and their job is to press the button and start world war three uh, well um no that that's a little more strategic i would have thought in in that particular uh, example, I was just think because we as you talk about emergent properties and the thing about emergent properties is that they you, they're non predictive, you, you can't predict that you're actually going to get, you know, you can probe and sense and respond to see whether or not the adjustments you've made within your organization is actually going to give you this mm -hmm. cultural change or this emergent change that that you're seeking. Um, um, because everything is so entangled and you don't know whether you're actually touching the right levers with the right people um, to being able to achieve uh, the outcome. And I, I, I think, you know, this notion of a, an algidonic uh, uh, system um, really is... Uh, it, it, it tries to build in some of that autonomic response so that um, that's, that's equivalent to being, you know, within, uh, oh, try and think, you know, if, the, if, the, you, if you get a fright, then there's a shot of adrenaline released into the system. Boom. You know, so that you can do extraordinary things like uh, some people have, you know, seen a car collapse on a child and been able to lift the whole weight of the car and drag the child out rapidly. And it's 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 that sort of response that um, needs to be and typically designed into a system in, in a way that there's some redundancy uh, 
within a system. Mm. But too often in organisations today, there's, um, there's no redundancy. It's seen as inefficient. And so, you know, areas are, are cut out which, you know, it's pretty much strips muscle off the bone. You know, you hear organ people in organizations say, yeah, we're down to the bone. Uh, and so it, it is part physical, but also part in, um, of the extent to which people actually work together to being able to do it. And that you won't suddenly get people working together but if you've had a lot of practice in an organization being collaborative, then when a crisis occurs, they can do the, the equivalent of lifting the car. Um, but that signal would have gone to the headquarters in almost instantaneous. That if, if it's this, I need to know about it. Mm -hmm. Bang. Um, and but at the same time these people haven't waited for the response they've they've reacted in a way that was expected of them and then the people haven't gone hey why aren't you doing your job why are you over them helping them you know they've gone yeah of course you're over there helping them so i'm um, again i'm trying to understand this with uh, a limited <laughs> mind um, so what's coming up for me is sort of the relationship between perception, cognition, and like the amygdala and the limbic brain that, yes. right, that I, I have ducked to avoid a flying object before my eyes have even seen it. Well, it has seen it, but right. you haven't registered it. Right. So, so be you, it before I'm aware, be be yeah, before I'm yes, aware of seeing it. You, you, yes. That's right. Before you're aware that you've seen it, right. and, and and that's where you know you, that whole and and that's a, a pretty good you know singular example of what we're talking about. There was that algodonic that's part of the algodonic system. You go well. Look, if I stand still, that brick could hit me on the temple and and, and kill me. Um, versus, crikey, get out the way. And and then you go, bloody hell, what was that? You hadn't even registered it was a brick until it broke into three parts on the ground in front of you. Yeah, but the, it could also be a bird or the uh, oh, sure. or the shadow of an airplane. So that's what I'm kind of curious about is how do you know the, the speed, well, the immediacy and the the extent of the response when we know that so many of our perceptions turn out to be based on past fears and and constructs and images rather than reality. So I'm wondering how yeah. you bake effective algodonic. I've never heard that word before, but I'm really liking it on my tongue. <laughs> how you bake that effectively into organizations. And that's why I asked about judgment. So um, you, you do si simulations um, in defense. They do war gaming all the time. Um, but run managers through um, uh, scenarios, not to say, hey, this will happen, but if it did, what would you do? Um, and, uh, and those are you know, absolutely uh, crucial because they um, learn a set of behaviors around the need to collaborate in order to resolve um, a, a particular issue where collaboration slowly gets baked in to the organization as to, yes, of course, um, I, I, I see this coming and I, I need to go and speak to, you know, cut out the hierarchy and, and close the loop on that pronto. Um, and and cyber security may be the biggest threat. Um, well, it is the biggest threat, but you can, it's not just about systems, right? If there's a penetration in the system, then who finds it? Is it on my desk? Is it on yours? Um, and and how did it get past the CTO? Well, those are all questions that get answered in the review. Mm -hmm. But it's what happens what I do about it when my screen starts playing silly buggers and I believe that, you know, there's a cyber threat at, yeah. at play. So it's um, almost and, almost and like how the... do I respond to that rapidly to close the systems down. 
yeah. and close it down before you've got CEO or board approval. Yeah. So it's like the Secret Service tackling the president. There you go. Absolutely. And, but they practice that time and time again. Uh -huh. you know, I wonder if the president does. I'm pretty sure the Secret Service do. <laughs> I wonder how good presidents are at getting tackled. Well, <laughs> I, I guess you'd go gently on an 80 year old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, particularly yeah. particularly if the, some of these Secret Service uh, agents are bloody, you know, linebackers or something. That <laughs> <laughs> Built like a brick shit house, as we would say in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so that then, you know, as we come back to to this, gives us a, a view of what we need to to think about. What we need to think about across the domains that need to stay connected in order to deliver on on this outcome mm. and and that we can see that how each of these elements help contribute to achieving compliance and then getting the shift to more collaborative behaviors mm -hmm. now the last one i'm intentionally not going to do a a, a, a lot uh, on but for each of those let me um, switch that on. Um, we can do this just to begin with, uh, you know, at the I'm going to put, say, strategy in here. Uh, let me blow it up a bit. Strategy in there. And that when that shows up um, poorly, you know, could you, you know, give me one word that uh, shapes that? And when it shows up exceptionally well, what does uh, that uh, look like? And what I might be able to say here is that um, strategy is, um, well, in fact, I use their word, ad hoc, um, that there's almost no strategy in existence at all. And, uh, but when it's working well, then it is indeed um, collaborative and, and coherent. That, and, and, um, and you can play with these words. Um, some people like to use dynamic because they're, you know, strategy like operations is constantly moving. Then the question arises is, so in order to get from where we are to there, is there one word or one main thing that we would need to do to actually shift that... Um, uh, to, to, to actually shift from, you know, an ad hoc framework to something that's that's quite dynamic. And we would do that for, for each of these. And, um, and, and so you would create a, a, a situation of going, well, um, we will successfully move from the pink to the green by doing if we if we do transformation t1 and and that could be in that particular case um uh, having uh, and i will say actually having an overall view of the system design being the crucial thing of all the things that we could do that is perhaps the most crucial because with that system design in place then we can think about better integration of planning and thinking of the future state. And, and you repeat that for operations. You repeat that for governance. 
and um, again you, you you know you'd move from one condition to the the better with your designed transformation I'll just label them as T2 and T3 in this case and then you've got a, a set of actions here that if they are successfully executed should drive the shift that you're looking for in getting people to um, feeling and acting as though they're you know less in a constabulary organization and far more a partner in the progress of meaningful governance of a, of a maritime system. Um, now, each of those can be broken down, of course, because for each of those nine boxes, you can do subsets of that underneath so that you can get into far more detail for, that you would need to do for such a, a large-scale transformation. But on a smaller scale, you can just take the um, conversation from the three main circles on the how. So it, you're, you're checking then as to whether or not um, people, as they are transformed, can still see their place in the larger world and indeed evaluate their contribution towards um, achieving the desired change and meaning that they're seeking in life. Hmm. Well, this is a lot. <laughs> Yeah, there's, but the thing is, you see, it, it, it is a long conversation, but there, there are no simple answers, right? That we are working in a complex world and that you will hear people talk about it being, you know, volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous, you know, VUCA world. Yeah. There's a, there's a better acronym, actually, and it's TUNA. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> and that's turbulent uncertain, novel, and ambiguous. And what I like about tuna over VUCA is that novelty that it brings in because it's the emergent property that you're seeking will be novel. That's the change that you wanted. So you're introducing novelty. And the world will change as a consequence of that and create novelty because of the change that you're seeking so that it needs to be, you know, a constant dynamic. And therefore a conversation needs to keep going. And that whilst it's a lot, um, one needs to, one last shot of the, the chart, one needs to keep revisiting this in a constant loop, right? That, and, and, and that's how you make progress. Hmm. All right. So we're, 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 <laughs> where my mind is going is, so when I work with organizations, this is tremendously helpful. And I'm also trying to uh, translate some of these you know, business jargon terms into, say, an individual or a family, a community, a sports team, anywhere humans yep. congregate. Um, I'm afraid I don't, I don't have time for it now. I have other... Uh, Appointments yes. and, and and frankly, my brain is full. So I don't. I would just start <laughs> nodding. If you, if you talk more, I would just nod and drool at this point. <laughs> uh, but it still comes down to asking why questions to derive meaning, exploring how that community or family it connects, and how they connect and stay connected what it is that you want to change, and ideally co-create that, and then. I have the question, well, if we did this, because now you're getting buy-in, if we did this, do we think that would achieve that? So, well, let's give it a go. There's the little experiment. Yes, that worked. Should we do it again? And away you go around and around. Yeah. And I'm, I'm remembering, you know, your tagline, no problem too big. And what's emerging from this conversation for me is no part too small, too insignificant. No person. Oh, no. Right. That it's, In fact, it, I would, yeah, yeah I'd, I'd ask you to underline that um, because uh, what, what I would like individuals to think is that, you know, you matter more than you think, which was the, one of the points from our last conversation. Uh, you matter more than you think because if you see your place in that, trans you have a view 
on, on how to improve even just one part of what we've been talking about, then you've got a, you're a vital cog in the wheel. Yeah, the, 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 anything that's excluded is going to be a drag on the system. That's it. Ah, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> but you also have the opportunity in that and your contribution might be to getting rid of stupid stuff because a lot of people are in their organization and they understand what's not working and why. Well, speak up. Let's, let's just say instead of starting this, what if we just stopped doing these two things? Hmm. Yeah. Beautiful. Richard, thank you so much. I feel I feel like there's a PhD in here. <laughs> we just you know, I know you can you, with your tablet, you can zoom in and in and in and in. I feel like that's uh, that's a metaphor for for how deep this goes and how um, how much sensitivity and skill a person could develop while making the world a better place and solving hard problems. That's right. Yeah. So, and that there's scope for everyone to grow in this. Yeah. So before we go, tell folks where they can find you and, yeah. and who, who might seek you out uh, for help. Well, I, I um, mentor and teach in uh, this sort of systems thinking and helping people um, be commercially smart in a uh, complex world. Um, my web site is underneath my name on the screen www.drrichardhodge.com and uh, there's an inquiry form through there if you'd love to reach out uh, there's plenty of materials on uh, my website as well uh, that are accessible and um, the opportunity also to subscribe to my um, mostly monthly sometimes weekly <laughs> newsletter ah. <laughs> Okay. And the doctor in, in drrichardhodge.com is just two letters, DR. DR, that's correct. Great. Richard, thank you so much. And, uh, it's been an absolute joy, uh, Howie. Yeah, I will, uh, let's, let, let's keep it going and, um, you know, so solve the world's problems. Yeah, that's right. At least make progress, right? I, I, I don't know whether we'll get to solve them because that, that loop will continue to go. Okay, so there'll we'll be, we'll, be employment. <laughs> That's it, exactly. And uh, why we need humans over AI. Oh, right on. That's another conversation for another day. I it think. is indeed. All right. Thank you, Richard. Take care. Cheers now. Bye-bye.